بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله. So the author said, فقه. According to the previously mentioned religious definition, is more specific than علم, knowledge. Probably should put maybe the Arabic word there, علم, knowledge, because it is valid to apply the word, the term علم, knowledge, to fiqh and to grammar and to other things. Thus, every fiqh is knowledge and not every knowledge is fiqh. Even linguistically, fiqh is comprehension, fahm. While knowledge is ma'arifah, ma'arifah. So, I looked in some of the dictionaries about the word ma'arifah. And... Without going into a long talk about that, what I gathered from Al Misbah Al Munir and from Al Maqayis, these two dictionaries, is that Ma'rifa has the meaning of being acquainted or familiar, acquaintance or familiarity. Usually they translate ma'rifa as knowledge. So, like we said last time, we have three words here. We have fiqh, ilm, and ma'rifa. Fiqh, what's fiqh? Fiqh is fahm, understanding. What's ilm? Ilm is ma'rifa. But ilm and ma'rifa are not really exactly synonymous, but usually they're both translated as knowledge. According to the terminology, knowledge is a perception of what is knowable. A perception of what is knowable, that means conceiving or the conception of what is knowable i.e. to realize that which its case is that it could be known, whether existent or not. Realizing what could be known, whether it exists or it does not exist. Because knowledge pertains to what exists and what does not exist. Yani al-ilm Knowledge pertains to the ma'loom. Ma'loom means what's known. And what's ma'loom could be existing or not existing. Conforming to how it really is. Meaning knowing it as it really is, conceiving it as it really is. That is such as realizing, i.e. conceiving the human to be a living creature that utters. Or realizing that the world, which is everything other than Allah, is an occurrence. In both cases, if someone conceived the human being to be, for example, a walking, talking creature, then this conception complies with reality. So that conception that complied with reality is called ilm, knowledge. Also, if someone conceived that the world is something that has a beginning, meaning that the world, which is everything other than Allah, all of the universe, everything other than God, is an occurrence. then this conception complies actually with reality. So the conception of something that complies with reality is called ilm, knowledge.
Ignorance is perception of something contrary to how it really is. Like conceiving the human as a living creature that neighs. That's the sound of a horse. If someone conceived the human being as a creature that neighs. Or the philosopher's conception of the world being eternal. If someone conceived the world as something that was always existing, then this conception of that thing does not comply with its reality. So that is not ilm. Rather, that's jahl, that's ignorance. Some have described this type of ignorance as compounded ignorance. Meaning, what here has been described so far, what did he say? Ignorance is what? Did he say ignorance is not knowing something? No. He said ignorance is perception of something contrary to how it really is. Perceiving or conceiving something differently from its reality. Some have described this type of ignorance as compounded ignorance. Not just ignorance. The author said ignorance. He didn't say compounded ignorance. Some said, no, what the author is talking about is something more specific. It's compounded ignorance. And they considered mere ignorance the sheer lack of knowledge of something such as our lack of knowledge of what is under the seven earths or what is in the depth of the seas. This mere ignorance is not contained in the author's aforementioned definition of ignorance. And it is not called jahl according to him. Just not knowing something is not what the author is talking about here. So, Imam al-Haramain, he's saying... Ignorance is having a misconception. But the explainers of this text said what Imam al Haramain is describing as ignorance is actually not just ignorance, something more than that. It's he's actually talking about a misconception because. Mere ignorance is just not knowing something. The definition that includes both types is to say ignorance is the absence of knowledge of that which is investigated. Ignorance is the absence of knowledge of that which is investigated, meaning mentally investigated. You are looking for it mentally i.e. that which its case is that it would be sought and hence realized. That thing which it would be sought and then realized and then conceived, that would be, meaning that absence of knowledge would be, either because it was never realized from the beginning, so you just don't know, which is mere ignorance, or because it was realized differently from how it is in reality, which is compounded ignorance. That means a misconception. It is called compounded because there are two types of ignorance involved. Ignorance of the conceived issue and ignorance of being ignorant because he thinks that he conceived it. Oyib. Necessary knowledge, al-ilm al-daruri, is knowledge that does not require reflection or deduction. It takes place by the self's mere encountering the issue. If one were to translate the statement of the scholars very literally, it's like they're saying it takes place by the person merely directing himself towards it. By one merely directing himself towards it, he becomes knowing of it. Uh, but it's not a condition even to direct yourself. 
Necessary knowledge takes place by just encountering the issue. The human is, in, is compelled to realize it. The human is compelled to realize it and cannot push it away from himself. That includes the knowledge that occurs by any of the five senses. Yani, it is a knowledge that is born in him without him going through a process. That includes the knowledge that occurs by any of the five senses. Hmm. So, this knowledge that is born in one and that knowledge which one is compelled to realize. How do you get that? There are several ways. It includes the knowledge that occurs by any of the five senses. Now these five senses, we'll mention them inshallah. Hearing, the power embedded in the nerves in the bottom of the ear canal through which sounds are realized by way of air adapted to the manner of the sound. By way of air adapted to the manner of the sound. The air around the body, the air around the body adapts to that sound. The air around the body adapts to the sound of the body. And then the air will move. So the air, is, it gets modified. The air around the body gets modified and then the air moves and then it reaches you. The air reaches you, that modified air. So hearing is the power embedded in the nerves in the bottom of the ear canal through which sounds are realized by way of air adapted to the manner of the sound. It means modified air. That air reached the ear canal, and upon that, Allah creates realization of the sound in, it, in the self. When that ear gets to your ear canal, then Allah will create in you realizing a sound. Then when you realize that sound, what happens? A knowledge is born in you. You just heard something. Sight. The power deposited in the hollow nerves that converge at the brain. That means they meet at the brain and they end at the eyes. Through which colors, shapes, and other things whose realization is created by Allah upon using this ability are realized. So that means Allah created in you the power to see some shapes, some colors, etc. Motion and stillness. Smell. The power embedded in two protrusions resembling breast nipples at the front of the brain. So, a doctor helped me out here because I wasn't sure what protrusions was the scholar talking about. So the doctor showed me a picture of the underside of the brain, like you're looking from underneath. And then there's two little things there, two little knobs or something like that. So apparently that's what it's talking about. Smell, the power embedded in two protrusions resembling breast nipples at the front of the brain. Through them, scents are realized by way of air adapted to the manner of the odor. Same thing for the smell, like we said about the sound. So it's not the smell that leaves your body or moves from your body. Rather, it's the air around the body that adapts to that body. Taste. The power spread throughout the nerves on the tongue through which flavors of things that have flavors are realized. Upon being mixed with salivary fluid in the mouth and contacting the nerves, Allah creates the realization. So, for example, 
You're walking down the street minding your business. All of a sudden, you taste blood in your mouth. So what do you do? You didn't see it. So how do you know there's blood in your mouth? What made you know? What? How was there knowledge born in you because you tasted it and then you spit and you saw your your mouth was, your spit was red. Uh, so you were right. Sensation, the power spread throughout the body through which heat, cold, moisture, dryness, and the like are realized. Upon contact, Allah creates realization. Also, you can feel within yourself, like the hunger. When that happens to you, when your stomach is growling, you know it. A knowledge is born in you. That's ilm daruri. Necessary knowledge. These five senses are obvious and their existence is confirmed. As for the extrasensory perception confirmed by the philosophers, it is unconfirmed for Ahlu Sunnah because it lacks evidence. There's no evidence for a sixth sense or any other sense besides those five. So that's necessary knowledge. By way of your sound senses, as long as they're sound. Sound senses, that does not include like looking through a microscope or looking through a, a, a telescope. Because that's not seeing something through some normal means or normal way. Does not include, for example, the one whose senses have been compromised by drugs or alcohol. Does not include the one whose senses, uh, who hallucinates because of heat, for example. So take that without me going further. You might need that sometime. You get in a, de a debate with a scientist or something like that. Or a Muslim who thinks that science is something that it's not. So you get necessary knowledge through your sound senses. Is there any other way to get necessary knowledge? Besides the knowledge that takes place through any of the five senses, necessary knowledge also takes place through tawatur. Like knowing the existence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the occurrence of miracles by his hand and the inability of the creation to discredit them. All right. Tawatur. We're going to talk about tawatur. So I don't want to make um, too many details or go into too many details about it now. So Tawatur is that type of news, transmitted information that has certain qualities. It's a mass narration. When I say a mass narration, that doesn't mean just because a lot of people narrated it, it's true. There are details that I'm not going to talk about now. So there's a type of mass narration called Tawatur, in which if all of the conditions are fulfilled, then whatever is conveyed by such a way, it is definitely true. That news is absolutely true, infallibly true. Even if it came through the route of Kufar, it's definitely true. It cannot be false, it's impossible to be false. So there are conditions for that. So whatever um, yani news that comes by way of Tawatur, it also promotes necessary knowledge. That knowledge which is born in one and he cannot push it away from himself. Some scholars argued that Tawatur does not promote necessary knowledge. They argued that Tawatur, it promotes knowledge but through contemplation, thinking, research, checking, then you can get knowledge. Not it's just going to be born in you by Tawatur. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he said, that saying is nothing. And our evidence that Tawatur does promote necessary knowledge that is born in one that he cannot push away from himself is the existence of such knowledge in people who lack the critical thinking skills needed to arrive at such knowledge that those people said. 
like who? Like the children, the small children, who they know with a correct knowledge that Muhammad existed, that the Kaaba exists, that China exists, for example. They know it with a true, correct knowledge that's not based on research and checking and things like that. So when we saw people who had a true, certain knowledge, not based on research and checking and thinking and pondering, then we knew that Tawatur does promote necessary knowledge. So we have two ways of getting necessary knowledge. The sound senses, Tawatur. Is there any other way? Yes. Among the necessary knowledge is that knowledge which takes place intuitively, like knowing that all of something is greater than some of it, and that negation and confirmation cannot be simultaneous. It's called badiha in Arabic, badiha, which basically means immediate. So that's something mental. It's not from the senses, and it's not from news. The first one was senses. When we say the senses, we are talking about basically input. How do you know about what's going on around you? Your senses. So your senses give you input and you get knowledge that you cannot fight off. And then you have news, certain news that comes from such a route, in such a way that also knowledge is born in you. Then there's another way that's not a way that's by input. Rather, it's something already in you. It's intuitive. It's immediate. So it's called in Arabic, badiha. That's intellect. So among the necessary knowledge is that which takes place intuitively, like knowing that all of something is greater than some of it, all of something is greater than some of it or more than some of it. And that negation and confirmation cannot be simultaneous. You can't say or wouldn't be correct had it been said. I went to the store yesterday, but I didn't go to the store yesterday. The author said, as for acquired knowledge, it is knowledge that requires reflection and deduction. So both of them are knowledge. One of them doesn't require any effort, and one of them does. Even if it's a little bit of effort. Doesn't have to be had, meaning exertion of effort, but it involves some um, activity. Being active.